You can private message people as well. If you see them in the chat box, you want to say hi to. Uh, this is sort of virtual networking. So that's also okay. And as some of the conversation does go on a little bit, we will make sure to leave the chat box open 10, 15 minutes after the event. So you can continue to network, maybe exchange some business information because that's something we are continuing to encourage. Um, I really want to uh, take a minute to thank um, the controller, our board directors that's on this call as well. And thank you so much and to, to, to take the time to do this. Um, you can see I have a little virtual background, I think somewhere behind me here. Uh, anyways, uh, the sponsor of the association is still important to keep us going. So we want to take a minute and thank him for that as well. Also want to say happy 21st day of the Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, earlier today, I was at a, um, uh, a session with Nielsen as they report some of the data. Billy Motto was speaking on there. He was saying something I thought was kind of neat. Um, Asian Americans in general, we from maybe a few decades ago, decades ago, we went from the back of the house and now we are in front of the house. And we were, before we're being influenced and now we're influencers. Uh, so I thought it was kind of neat. Uh, Nielsen did a measurement of Asian Americans in terms of their GDP here in um, the United States. We went from the 19th largest uh, if, uh, GDP, if you were to take all of the Asian American buying power, now to the 15th largest. So 15th largest, so you know, in some kind of comparables, uh, that's similar to the whole country of Indonesia and the whole country of Mexico. That's something we can be proud of as we go forward. Um, ABA, uh, so you know, has been working hard at getting through the virus. Our theme has been hashtag working through the virus. Um, some of the advocacy we continue to do uh, earlier in the beginning in, in March, uh, we were advocating for the federal government in terms of the income tax filing. Uh, we're very happy to announce that they did extend that from April 15th to July 15th. Uh, we also inform our members to stay ahead of the PPP in terms of its information, uh, LA microloans, SBA uh, disaster loans. We are very uh, early in getting those information out. Uh, we're also proud to announce that many of our members did receive the funding. Um, as we now push in terms of language, in terms of shaping those language, uh, we did hear uh, from Congressman Judy Chu that they are trying to extend from the eight weeks reporting uh, to, uh, to the end of the year. And they're also figuring out ways to reduce the 75% rule. Uh, I think currently we are working, make sure you guys have uh, the forgiveness application as that is very important to businesses. Um, ABA, uh, last few months, as we transition to be more online, trying to help people, try to help our members to lead remotely. We had a video session about that, also about digital marketing. We actually did a virtual happy hour as well, trying to keep people connected. Um, and yesterday, uh, we were able to feature three of our members and how they worked through the virus. We're excited about the upcoming events that we're doing. Um, we're going to be hosting a tra uh, training seminar next week with Little Tokyo Business Improvement District about getting back to business and reopening. Uh, and the following week, um, there is still an election year, so we're doing a briefing on legislation that will affect California businesses. So please stay tuned to, to, for that as well. Uh, and then the middle of next month, we'll be doing a session about public agencies and how to do business with them. So it's a great time to begin your membership with ABA if you uh, don't have a membership. So encourage that, of course. Uh, so today, it leads me to today, um, I'll be doing some quick introductions in terms of our speakers. Uh, I'll introduce uh, our controller for a little bit, and then I'm going to turn this conversation to our host. Uh, if you have any questions today, uh, please do use the chat box and send it to the facilitator or uh, the host, and we will do our best to answer them. Um, you can also email us at uh, info at abala.org for any other general questions that you may have. Um, to begin, uh, let me set the tone a little bit, saying that California, as you know, may not know, it's the fifth largest economy in the world. It has deeply, deeply impacted by corona, corona virus. It caused a huge disruption in the supply chain, retail, hospitality, and the way we do business. California businesses are responsible. They are getting ready to make changes, adopt new ordinance, because safety does remain a priority for many businesses. 
Today, we're very happy that the California State Controller, Betty Yee, is here to share her thoughts on the impact of this pandemic. She was elected in November 2014, following a two-term service uh, on the California State Board of Equalization. As the controller, she continues to serve the board as its fifth voting member. Re-elected for her second term as a controller in 2018, Ms. Yee is the only 10th woman in California history to be elected statewide office. It's sort of sad, uh, but we're making some progress. As a state chief fiscal officer, Ms. Yee chairs the franchise, ta franchise tax board and serves as a member of the California Public Employees Retirement System, the CalPERS, and the California State Teachers Retirement Systems, the CalSTRS board. These two board alone has a combined portfolio more than $620 billion. It's amazing. On numerous occasions, Ms. Yee did attend many of our functions and very active with many of the community groups. Um, I know it doesn't mean a lot for many people, but we like to say it as an Asian group. Um, her bachelor degree is from Berkeley and has a master in public administration. So welcome, Betty. Um, before we get to you, I'm going to quickly introduce our, our board directors as well, uh, and we'll get going with the program. Uh, ben Pasquale is uh, also on the board of ABA. He's a partner at Thong Yu Wong Li, uh, which is a full-service accounting firm and consulting firm. The firm provides accounting and a taxation service, tax compliance, planning, estate planning, bookkeeping, uh, business skill management, mergers and acquisition, what don't you do? And internal control value evaluations for companies large and small. Uh, prior to working at this uh, accounting firm, he worked at the Viking Cruises. So very glad you got out of that right now. It's tough industry. <laughs> and before that, he was with Ernst & Young. Two bachelor degree from Berkeley. That was good, right? Uh, also, of course, he's a CPA. Uh, Steve Lee, uh, which is the founder of the Garrett Group. Uh, Steve has spent 27 years of experience in a wide range for both private and public companies. He assisted clients with initial public offering, public and private debt offering, corporate restructuring, mergers and acquisition, Sarbane Oxy compliance, and numerous SEC uh, periodic filings. He has a bachelor degree at U, uh, UCI, and I think, and you, I think you might have told me you also teach there when time allows. The master in USC, and more importantly, he's the treasurer for your Asian Business Association. So, Steve, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to you. Thanks, Dennis. Controller Yi, thank you very much for making the time to uh, to speak with us. Yes. I'm sure your schedule is extremely hectic. Um, and things are a bit chaotic, probably to say the least. But so we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Of course, thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone and thank you, Dennis. Um, thank you, Ben and Steve. Um, you know, it is um, a time that is unprecedented but for all of us really. And, um, but what I will say about uh, my team at the controller's office and many of you knew my predecessor, John Chung, um, you know, in so many ways, our day-to-day -day work is really to, um, you know, prepare for crises like this. Um, and certainly, uh, our team has been uh, very active with respect to managing the state's cash. And and uh, I have to say that California was in a very, very strong position heading into this pandemic because um, uh, we had historic budget reserves. We had paid down um, uh, a lot of debt under the uh, leadership of uh, Governor Jerry Brown and the legislature. And so we really had... Um, a lot of uh, resources available and in the governor's uh, January budget that he introduced, um, he had uh, anticipated a moderate recession going into 2020 and 21. And uh, this pandemic obviously has created uh, and accelerated uh, the recession that is now before us. But first I wanna just say thank you to ABA. Uh, I hope all of you and your families are healthy and safe. Uh, never enough opportunities to say thank you to our frontline health workers who are just never. Tremendous work under such severe stress and uh, sacrifice, okay. and then to all of the workers okay. who who are um, Oscar. doing their best Yankee. to um, to keep all of us safe and healthy. Yankee. Oops. Um, what's going on? I. No. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. I think you're fine. 
No strange. Okay. Um, so uh, just thanks to everybody who's doing everything they can to keep us healthy and safe. You know, what I want to say about just ABA in general and Dennis and your leadership, but certainly the board as well, this is a time when associations like this are so critical um, as we look for support, uh, as we look at having a voice of advocacy in terms of uh, how we're going to plan uh, rebuilding this economy after the uh, after we reach the other side of this health crisis. And uh, more importantly, uh, the progress that we've made and we're celebrating API Heritage Month this month, as Dennis said, uh, you know, how do we build on that, um, you know, progress of the community as a whole? And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end with uh, some other responsibilities that we can uh, undertake uh, during this time. But the support of each other is really so important and uh, certainly um, have an ally in this office with respect to the needs of businesses and uh, very sensitive to um, just all of the responses to COVID that has affected businesses. And I know the uh, uh, workers' compensation executive order by the governor was really a, a huge hit on many of our businesses. Um, that one I actually did not see coming at all. And so I can only imagine how businesses are receiving that. But let me give you a little bit of a, uh, of a flavor of the uh, fiscal picture today. Um, some of the discussions that are currently underway and what we hope to get accomplished by the time uh, our new fiscal year starts July 1st. I'll also talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done for small businesses. Many of you have taken advantage of them. And then uh, kind of my own vision about how we can rebuild this economy because um, I think as we're looking at the day-to-day -day responses to this crisis, we ought not um, really forget about the fact that we are gonna rebuild and uh, we are gonna be stronger and uh, informed by the experiences during this crisis, but also um, every opportunity to look at doing our businesses differently that, that still can thrive and that can still um, sustain livelihoods. So, uh, so let me just start by saying, um, you know, the governor introduced this revised version of the budget last week on May 14th, the May revision. And generally every year when that happens in mid-May, it's really to update his uh, budget assumptions, particularly with respect to revenue after the April surge in personal income tax revenue and corporate tax revenue. And of course that didn't happen with the uh, deadlines pushed out to July. Uh, but um, the budget is uh, a share of the pain budget that he's updated. Uh, everything is getting a haircut, uh, some more severely in others, uh, than other areas. And, and But the big hallmark of this uh, revised budget is really um, not taking our foot off the gas pedal with respect to pressing the federal government for more assistance and more aid to states and to local governments. And this is important because um, as we're looking at uh, how the governor structured his revised budget, the cuts to public education, uh, the cuts to some areas of health care, the cuts to um, state employees' salaries, um, and the, some of the cuts to public safety that are in there are all predicated on um, uh, the availability of federal funds in order for them to restore it. So that is uh, something that we are continuing to press on. Um, you've been following the uh, discussions in Washington about the $3 trillion HEROES Act. Um, a lot of um, concerns about the accountability of states and how they're going to use that money. Uh, and uh, so I think that um, that if should we get that money, and, and I hope it is uh, around that amount, uh, we will be able to have some breathing room and restore some of these cuts. Uh, without that, we are going to have to probably go even deeper. And so, uh, but the, I will say that there are a couple of uh, perspectives about uh, the magnitude of the problem. So the governor's uh, Department of Finance is uh, suggesting that we have a $54.3 billion budget problem. Uh, the Legislative Analyst Office, which is the independent uh, analyst uh, arm of the legislature uh, is uh, predicting a rosier outlook with respect to revenue, depending on how deep the recession goes. Uh, if it is a um, you know, kind of a sharp um, uh, recession, if it's a uh, you know an L-shaped recession, uh, he, uh, the analyst believes it'll be a $31 billion budget problem. If it's a uh, U-shaped recession, recession uh, we'll probably be facing an $18 billion uh, problem. So you can see the wide variation in terms of the assumptions that people are making, the duration of this crisis, the recession is also um, under debate as well. So as I look at these numbers, so from my perspective, um, we have to have a balanced budget. We're not the federal government. We have to operate on a balanced budget. We can't print money, unfortunately. Um, so for us, it will be about um, having a budget that has integrity, where we know that we will have 
enough cash to pay the bills. There is a good deal of internal borrowing that's assumed in the governor's budget as well. Uh, and luckily we have the resources to do that. And uh, hopefully um, the federal uh, funds will come in such that it will not necessitate the state having to do any external borrowing uh, to uh, to keep the balance, uh, the, the budget balanced. So the, um, the, the cuts, as I said, deep cuts in education, um, childcare, um, no expansion, keeping existing slots funded uh, that are publicly funded, um, cuts to state employees salaries, many cuts in health and human services to our most vulnerable populations, our seniors, um, those with disabilities, um, and those are going to be very uh, hurtful cuts in terms of uh, uh, the realities that that uh, households will be facing uh, with, with with those cuts. Um, and, and then the other um, aspect of the budget, uh, which I thought was um, really interesting, is that we're going to continue to spend on the COVID-19 response. So um, this $54.3 billion problem is really a result of depressed revenue about 7.1 billion in uh, increased caseload and in many of our caseload driven programs, Medi-Cal, uh, many of the public assistance programs, and then also about another $6 billion in COVID-19 direct uh, um, expenditures uh, going into the budget year. Now, the good part about the other area of strength, uh, our governor was able to get a um, directly from the president, a, uh, a major disaster declaration. So FEMA is now sending money to the state to help with uh, offsetting some of these uh, direct COVID-19 costs. And so that will also be very, very helpful. But when you look at the reality of how all of this is gonna hit on the ground now, all of you I know have been experiencing over the last 10 weeks, uh, what this pandemic has meant uh, in terms of different ways of living, different ways of working. Um, I have two thirds of my team who are teleworking, but a good number of them have children at home getting school instruction. Um, and so uh, they're not only doing their day jobs, but they're also, uh, you know, kind of uh, providing counseling and teaching and being chefs. And so it's, it's just, uh, you know, a, a very stressful time for, for a lot of households. But, but when you look at how we're going to rebuild this economy, and all of you know this better than I, you know, this is a global pandemic that affected every sector of the economy, uh, some more deeply than others. But it's also a pandemic that revealed to us how vulnerable, you know, our, our workforce is in California. 4.7 million people have applied for unemployment. And so, you know, when you look at that, the governor is, is uh, predicting that we will have unemployment rise to about 24 and a half percent in the second quarter of 2020. And uh, so uh, he thinks it's just going to keep uh, growing. And, uh, and my hope is that when we continue to look at the response to the pandemic, that we can also look at rebuilding the economy at the same time. And so, you know, things like, um, you know, how do we uh, continue to harden our public health infrastructure to where uh, we know that uh, those communities are really the most vulnerable. We can actually uh, look at uh, putting some services there and, and creating jobs in those areas. How do we look at even, uh, for example, I know there's been a lot of back and forth about, you know, just uh, getting enough masks for people. And so, you know, we're doing business with other parts of the world on that, not just China, other parts too. And, but why don't we have light manufacturing of masks in California? Because we're going to need that over the long term. Uh, why aren't we looking at, I saw this great video yesterday that you just, I mean, it's a sight to behold. Um, you can't even um, compare with the magnitude of production in places like China, but uh, there was a wonderful video about what schools are going to look like when, um, you know, they're completely reopened in China. And just the idea that you've got temperature reading stations, you've got disinfecting stations, you've got masks at the ready. And just, so, you know, all those things are going to be part of our reality as well. And I think as we plan for our reopening, we ought to be thinking seriously about how we start to put people back to work to help really build out, uh, you know, those, those systems. So um, we also know, uh, as Dennis mentioned, supply chains have been disrupted. And so um, as we look at all of that, um, you know, this is not going to be the last crisis we're going to face. And so I think part of what, what we have to do in rebuilding this economy is also to look at how do we rebuild uh, and really become more resilient and strong. Uh, we're already seeing the effects of, of um, the um, extreme weather events, climate change, we're approaching the wildfire season. So there's just a lot that we need to do to just harden our systems to deal with these crises. And um, you know, a term I've been using a lot lately is, you know, how do we future-proof our economy as we rebuild it? Because uh, we've got to be prepared for these unanticipated or anticipated shocks and stresses that are going to hit us. And so how do we become more resilient to that? We know that for small businesses, if they shutter, it's very hard to reopen again. And so how can we um, be sure that they can be nimble, maybe pivot to do something else in the meantime? Uh, we've seen a lot of that, frankly, with some businesses, but not all of them. And so uh, to provide that support so that businesses can do that and still continue to, to earn a livelihood. 
And then the last thing I just want to touch upon relative to the budget is, um, and, and the reality is, we've asked these public health directives about sheltering in place, practicing physical distancing, wearing masks. Uh, obviously, sheltering in place is a challenge when there are many Californians who can't afford to shelter in place because of the high cost of housing. And I will say that housing will be a very topical, uh, urgent issue for the legislature, uh, in addition to the budget, about uh, how we have more stable housing for Californians uh, up and down the state. So how are the, how's the legislature looking at this? So the governor proposed this updated uh, revision to the budget. Now it's the legislature's turn to essentially analyze it, uh, put forth their version of what they think the budget should look like, where the costs ought to be, um, where, where there are some costs that should be cut, and present a balanced budget, uh, final um, budget bill to the governor. Uh, they will likely vote the legislature by mid-June, and the governor has until June 30th to sign the budget bill uh, that takes place effect, effective July 1st, the first day of the, ne the next fiscal year. Now, um, there have been some <clears throat> speculation that um, the assembly uh, may come back in July when we see the tax revenue coming in and uh, looking at another revision of the budget. Um, and I hope that's not the case. I think uh, what we need, really need right now is um, swift action with some certainty. Uh, and some certainty about how we're going to plan going forward. And I think the more disruption we have, even if we do have more money, that's good. Uh, that's going to help accelerate some of the planning that we have to do. Uh, but this is um, my hope is that we have a balanced budget by the end of June. Hopefully the pain will be lessened. Uh, maybe there will be more of a, a reception to the legislative analyst assumption about the revenues being more robust than what the governor is suggesting. And so, um, so the legislature will have um, essentially through mid-June, governor signs a budget by, by uh, June 30th, effective July 1st. Um, should be end of story, but it won't be the end of the story because we know that um, as schools begin to think about what their next year will look like. Now, uh, the superintendent did announce that schools will likely open late August, early September, looking very, very different uh, than how they look today. Uh, we know that uh, as work um, and uh, workers go back to work, as uh, businesses start up again, that we likely are not going to have um, uh, everyone uh, going back to jobs where they once were. And so uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of an alignment between work policies and certainly what happens in our schools. We've got, uh, one, I, I've already been speaking to a number of community groups about looking at issues like um, staggered work schedules, uh, which uh, may comport with then uh, staggered school schedules so that uh, the parents are home when the children are home. And so I think we just have to be flexible and nimble and, uh, and I hope that the directives that are coming out from the state and from local governments are just as flexible and nimble so that we can actually try to make this all work for uh, everyone and, and as many people can get back on their feet and, and regain their livelihood. So with respect to uninsurance, I talked about, uh, we gained about 3.4 million jobs after the Great Recession. Uh, California read, led the national recovery uh, and this pandemic uh, essentially um, ended the longest um, you know, growth of our economy. Uh, and uh, it's the, and when California obviously took the hit, uh, the rest of the country followed suit uh, shortly thereafter. So we have, uh, <clears throat> we have gained 3.4 million jobs. We have 4.7 million people out of work right now and growing. And so uh, the idea here is that we are gonna provide um, state unemployment augmented by the federal unemployment extension that increases uh, for <clears throat> the next period of uh, just a little under four months. And, um, and hopefully by that time, we will have a better sense of uh, where the economy is headed. But with respect to the um, assistance that businesses have been receiving, you know, a lot of the meaningful assistance has come from the federal government with the Paycheck Protection Act and some of the other um, assistance programs. At the state level, we have um, uh, a deferred interest-free um, sales tax up to $50,000 for businesses with less than $5 million in taxable sales. We've extended all the tax filing deadlines. Um, we have a small business disaster relief uh, loan guarantee program through our infrastructure and economic development bank uh, that's got $50 million in state funding, but this provides um, potential capital for those uh, business owners who could not access the federal funds. And then we have a, um, uh, a small business debt relief program as well uh, for existing uh, SBA borrowers. So a few programs that can help businesses, but clearly uh, more needs to be done. Uh, certainly as we think about what the fiscal space of businesses are going to look like, more needs to be done there and there will be costs attendant to that. Uh, but this is also a time for innovation about thinking about how we can have businesses be successful going forward. Uh, I just had a, a wonderful conversation with a group of restaurateurs um, 
and owned chains of restaurants in the Burbank area. And what they wanted the state to do was to help uh, really promote with big employers, especially, or employers generally, just to uh, stretch out the, uh, the lunch hour for their employees so that um, they could actually have more seatings you know, during the course of the lunch hour. So have lunch start from uh, 11 o'clock to three o'clock. You can have people go to lunch from 11 to noon, noon to one, one to two, two to three, just so they can get that uh, customer base really rebuilt up and uh, make it uh, really uh, fruitful and successful for them. But the one thing I do want to touch upon, because it's a theme that's really cut across uh, all sectors, um, I was just doing an interview with the uh, uh, California president of United Airlines and uh, my friend Janet Lampkin, and obviously the tourism industry has been hit hard, airlines have been hit hard, travel has been essentially uh, really stymied uh, during this pandemic, and she had asked, you know, what's it going to take for a sector like tourism to really come back? And, um, and I think from sector to sector, I'm hearing this, and, we're gonna, and we actually are seeing this with the slow, soft opening of economies, particularly in the restaurant industry, that um, for all Californians, um, I think not only have their, has their sense of economic security been toppled, but also I think we need to reestablish trust in terms of uh, our ability to ensure their health and safety. And that's gonna have to be demonstrated in a very um, transparent way uh, with the measures that we take to ensure our employee safety, our customer safety. And uh, that's something that uh, I hope that uh, can be done in a relatively short order because I think people do miss uh, gathering. I think they do miss uh, being in a social setting, uh, but we have to at the same time uh, do everything we can to uh, really uh, promote uh, their health and safety in the environments that we hope that they will be gathering in. And then lastly, let me just say before we go into questions, um, this is API Heritage Month. Um, it is a great time to celebrate, as Dennis said, um, you know, really a community that is beautifully diverse and really our strength is really how, di how diverse we are. Um, the fact that we have added so much, not just to our uh, national economy, but certainly here in California. Uh, the brain trust that we bring to so many sectors of our economy. But I do want to make one plug for a program and because we are woefully inadequate in terms of our response to the census. Um, and this is very important because um, so much of our history as an API community has been about exclusion and has been about, you know, really discrimination and, and being left out. And uh, the census is really the very first step to take to be counted. And we know many of our, our programs that, uh, that are funded by the federal government are funded on the basis of population. Uh, we know that our political representation is based on population when they divide up legislative districts, congressional districts, and even uh, more local um, elected districts. And then for all of you, I mean, you rely on census data in terms of looking at where you're going to grow your business, where you're going to put your stake in the ground, where you know you can attract a workforce, uh, where you know there are going to be needs that you can you know, provide for. So uh, this is so fundamental in terms of the economy uh, growing. And I think for for particularly the API community where we've had this history and frankly right now facing you know a lot of unfair discrimination and threats because um, you know there are ignorant people still who believe that you know the API, the API community i.e the Chinese created this virus um, and I think um, everything we're about is uh, growing this economy serving others being uh, responsible parts of our communities and really doing so much to um, really elevate uh, the success of our you know, children, our grandchildren and, and uh, those communities around us. So uh, I just wanna make a plug for the census. Um, we're about 60% response rate, uh, particularly for the API community, about 30% of our Asian immigrants are just filling out the census for the first time. So uh, please make it part of your everyday conversation. You can do it online if you haven't already done it. It only takes about five minutes, but those who can't do it online, I called like about 10 of my mother's friends who are homebound and was able to get them to do it. I had to practice my toy song with them, but it was okay. Um, but it was really great because um, they just felt like they were doing something for the good, for the future. So um, I hope that you'll help me in just being sure that we have a robust count uh, within our, our API community. And uh, so I think with that, Dennis, I want to turn it into a conversation because you've heard enough from me and uh, be happy to engage in, in questions. Thank you, Controller Yi. That was very, very informative and helpful. And obviously, there's a lot packed into what you just shared with us. So, uh, I don't. I'm sure your days are just extremely busy. I don't know. How you, I, I'm not even sure you even sleep at at, at, at this rate. You know, it's it's um, kind. Of, I think you're my fifth Zoom meeting. But I. <laughs> but, but that's the other thing. I mean, with technology, we're able to get just so much more done too. So. Right. Right. And, right. And connect more broadly. So happy to do it. Yeah, you know, you talked a lot about the recovery plans in terms of economic recovery and all that. And one of the questions that uh, we have for you in terms of 
Does, does the state of California have any plans to enter into any type of collaboration with the private sector to support this, the, the recovery plan? And if, the, if there are some, what would you recommend for an organization like ours, ABA, to embrace a meaningful role in that recovery effort? Uh, great question. And I think um, a couple of thoughts I have. And thank you for raising the question, Steve. Um, the governor has a, um, it's a huge task force. I think it's 80, more than 80 members, but they're now uh, divided up into three subcommittees. But his uh, um, jobs and, and economic recovery task force um, is exactly focused on what are the strategies going to be for, um, you know, opening up the economy again, rebuilding the economy and really sustaining, you know, uh, economic growth and, and uh, creating jobs. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are a couple ways to be involved. Um, one is, um, you know, I, I think to the extent that you've had successes during this pandemic about um, how uh, work has continued and how you've been able to serve customers, I think we need to hear what those are. Um, I'm going to send to Dennis the list of the people on the task force. If you know any of them, please contact them and write them. Um, they are looking for ideas. Um, you, you'll know many of them. Many of them are, are business leaders. And, uh, but I think this is one where there's not one size fits all. And that's what I really don't want to see happen. Um, and I think particularly with the uh, API community, with a lot of small businesses, with a lot of the, um, you know, just the different disciplines that uh, APIs work in, we have a lot to offer here. And so, um, you know, everything from uh, just the, 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 the the professions that require, you know, kind of more education and science, you know, related types of skills to, um, you know, looking at how we're going to have, um, you know, just people return to work in just the hospitality industry, which are, um, you know, traditionally have been low wage, but also how do we um, be sure that they can be sustained in terms of the next crisis that comes along. So there are many, many ways to weigh in. The other thing is um, your legislator, your legislators. Um, in the Senate, um, the state Senate, we have, you um, the Senate Democrats who have put forth a recovery plan that involves basically um, front loading income tax payments um, from the next few years uh, to then um, establish a $25 billion economic recovery fund. And the idea of that fund would be to help um, not only um, help with economic development and, and kind of business development, and probably less so with that, but just providing all these supports that people need to be able to do that. So looking at childcare, you know, looking at you know just some of the, uh, the the things that need to you know stabilize households so that people can actually you know go back to work, go back to running a business. And so um, that's the Senate's plan in terms of economic recovery. They also just yesterday put out a um, housing plan that is focused on housing construction of smaller units. Uh, particularly duplexes, accessory dwelling units and the like, uh, looking at um, essentially accelerating the environmental review of those projects up to 10 units so that it's more local review and uh, ex uh, expediting those reviews so that we can actually get housing construction you know, back, uh, back in gear. And we have such a huge housing need uh, uh, right now in California that was exacerbated by the pandemic. So I would say local legislators follow the task force of the governor, but weigh in. I mean, weigh in with specifics because uh, this is one where um, I have to say for all the executive orders that the governor has issued, um, most of them have had good impacts and there have been some that have had, um, you know, really, really hard impacts on people. And so I think it's really um, easy to do kind of a broad sweep about what would be good policy, but we, we know that, you know, the devil's in the details and, and not, every, um, not every business, not every sector, not every community is going to be uh, equally benefiting from some of these policies. So, so that, that would be my, my immediate uh, recommendation. Uh, and then I would use the strength of uh, ABA, um, you know, really joining forces with other business associations. You are all going to be so key to how this economy recovers. Because frankly, without you, it can't recover. And so, uh, as I look at, um, you know, just some of the voices that are talking about, uh, you know, what the economy should look like, um, it's very worker focused, which as it should be, because there are so many out of work. But I think uh, oftentimes the employer perspective is not robust enough. And so, I know all of you want to do right by your employees. But at the same time, you're saddled with a lot of requirements and uh, a lot of mandates. And so, you know, what are some of those that actually could be relaxed that doesn't, uh, that's not detrimental to the health and safety of your employees, to the health and safety of your customers? And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think could be very, very helpful because um, uh, this is not about waiting until the budget situation gets better or until our economy turns around to talk about these things. We have to do both at the same time. And so um, I think your input now would be very, very critical. 
Thank you very much for that. You know, I'm just curious, the task force that was assembled by the governor, uh, how representative of is the task force of the constituents of California? Uh, not. <laughs> For me, there were a couple things missing. One, uh, small business. Um, I think diversity could have been better. Uh, there was no one from our uh, educational institutions to speak of, really representing educational interests. Because I do think work and education have to go hand in hand now. Not only with respect to, you know, kind of if you're really going to start thinking about long term economic recovery, uh, looking at skills development, upskilling, looking at workforce issues. But also because of you know this new um, COVID um, reality of where we're probably going to need to sync up you know when people are in school and when um, you know people are at work and or when they need to be home with children from school. So I think all of that has to sync up. So there were um, really kind of um, a lot of representatives lacking. Um, and uh, I'll also send to you the subcommittees that they've divided into because uh, it suggests to me that. Um, because of who's on it, and this is my own perspective about it, um, that you know there is a lot of status quo thinking. Um, there are some academics on it as well, um, but um, I don't know in terms of like people who really have been experiencing the realities of the last ten weeks. Uh, we, I would have liked to have seen more of those representatives on the task force. I see. I see. Thanks for sharing with that. Um, just for the interest of time, I know Ben has to go pretty soon, so I just want to give Ben an opportunity to ask this question if he, if he has one. Great. Thanks, Steve. Sure. Um, thank you once again, um, <laughs> for all your uh, assistance in walking us through and shedding some light as to the myriad of problems everyone's going through. I uh, really appreciate your in-depth analysis on that. Um, I, I guess since there's so much going on, uh, one of the questions that I sort of had was, for you personally, what are some of your biggest concerns and sort of what keeps you up at night in terms of going through everything that we're going through at this moment? Yeah. Um... I'm going to talk about it on a couple of levels, Ben. Um, you know, what keeps me up at night is, um, you know, really, um, I guess a concern, a concern by government at all levels to be, um, you know, not, not quick enough, not decisive enough, not swift enough in terms of actions that really can uh, help uh, move this economy forward. Uh, obviously, we're all very focused on health and safety, paramount, paramount, paramount. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I don't think uh, this is going to be one of those instances where um, we have to keep health and safety uh, front and foremost, but there's not going to be a perfect time. And so I hope that we can, you know, continue to look at how to keep people uh, the most safe, the most healthy, and still be able to um, have the economy uh, come back on its feet. Um, because actually, it, it, it'll affect, uh, I think, a lot of things. Not only will it affect, um, you know, the coffers, the state coffers, and, and local coffers as well in terms of our budgets. But um, I've been concerned for a long time, and it's something we don't talk about in the API community a lot. Um, I did talk about it during my all-staff meeting um, because it was um, something that I had to do as well. But, um, you know, there is a very uh, good possibility that uh, when we reach the other side of this crisis, that we're going to be faced with a pandemic of trauma. Um, you know, there's been so much that has been disrupted for people, and um, and I don't know that we've faced that head on yet. And you know, and my own sense wasn't trauma; it was just stress. I I learned that a good friend of mine in Ohio was um, dying of cancer, and you know, the first thing I want to do is get on a plane and be with her. I can't be with her, and I, I could probably take the plane ride, but I can't be with her. And so, you know, things like that are very upsetting. And and I think, um, and I'm, that's just one example, but there are so many examples of where, you know, just I think the, 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 the issues of trauma that either we can't give voice to or that we're kind of not encouraged to give voice to are, are very real. And so I, I do worry about that. Um, the other thing I worry about is, um, you know, just kind of this ongoing, um, and, and, and I hope this changes in the future. And I think um, the more we can be upfront and, and speak out about this, but I'm very concerned about the attacks that the API community is getting. Um, this is something that uh, is really born out of ignorance with respect to this pandemic. I was very proud of um, Charlie Wu when he spoke out uh, in the New York Times article that, you know, pandemics know, they don't know geographics, they don't know um, ethnicity, they don't know, they have, there's no identity of pandemics along those lines. And so, you know, to really have this kind of be a stain on our community and, and, and it's those subtle things, you know, it's not going to be that people are going to kind of come to our face and say, you know, you're responsible for it. It's going to be the way that we're treated. 
going to be the way that we, you know, see customers come back to our establishments. It's going to be the way, I mean, I get it, you know, every now and then. It's very subtle, but it's it's there and it's stressful because you know that people are thinking about it and uh, have that on their mind. And but, but how do you respond to that, you know, aside from just, uh, you know, raising awareness about, you know, what a pandemic is. So so those are the things that really um, kind of are, are uh, things that are on top, uh, top of mind for me. And then lastly, I will say, um, you know, we have, um, I think a tremendous opportunity in rebuilding the economy to deal with issues of equity. Um, there are, you know, people seem to think about, always think about the API community as being this monolithic community, but we know that we have many uh, members of our community who are, you know, just really uh, um, experiencing health disparities. Uh, or at a higher propensity of chronic health conditions. And we're seeing, and there was this article that just startled me yesterday in the San Francisco Chronicle that half of the deaths in San Francisco have been um, people of Chinese American descent. And, and yes, they are more in congregate living situations. Yes, they you know, tend to have you know, hypertension and other chronic conditions, but that was startling to me. And so um, there is a, uh, an intern at the University of California, San Francisco now, really doing a deep dive about why that is. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the stigma of like, you know, just um, having to go to a doctor or still you know, not being able to freely feel like you know, we can you know, take care of ourselves. And so you know, those things still worry me. And even though, um, you know, I think all of us are very aware of those kinds of things. Uh, obviously, we still have loved ones, generations of our loved ones that uh, still aren't, and those tend to be the more uh, at high risk of the of the of the virus. Control, yeah, I have one more uh, question. Uh, just as you were sharing about what keeps you up at night, one of the things that keep me up at night is the potential of the second wave coming and what what implication that would have. Um, you know, I, I, as a finance person, economics person, I look out and say. I know it's bad right now, but the second wave comes and it's prolonged. It's, and a lot of the pundits are saying the second waves can be even worse than the first wave. Um, how, how much of that is factored into the recovery plans that you guys have? And how much consideration do you guys put into that? And um, obviously no one can predict whether it's going to happen or not, but you know, is that something that you guys have factor into and what type of uh, contingency plan do you have in place to, to, to be able to address that? Yeah, that's exactly right, Steve. Uh, it is factored in because a lot of the sign-offs that the uh, uh, that a lot about the sign-offs that counties have to get from the state are exactly looking at the six-factor plan that the governor put out. That um, you know you have to have hospital bed capacity should there be a surge. Uh, you have to be able to be nimble in terms of uh, reinstituting shelter in place. You have to be nimble in terms of uh, you know having. Um, you know the, the the ability to deal with you know kind of next surge in so many ways, um, and and so I, I would say that we're looking at this pandemic uh, with a little bit more of a medium term look. Uh, obviously, economies are opening up. Uh, the numbers suggest to us that California has been doing very well uh, because we've been really serious about these directives. And I think as long as we are serious about these directives and understand that we may have to go back to them. Uh, if we see signs of a surge that uh, uh, hopefully it won't be uh, as deep hitting as it was when uh, we first faced the crisis uh, in March. So, so this is um, all very much factored in. It was why we saw a lot of the dissension between uh, some parts of California that wanted to reopen much more quickly, much more aggressively, and, and the state, because um, you know, there were criteria that we felt were important to have in place uh, should there be a surge. And, and we've seen that as we've had uh, gatherings prematurely uh, without proper protection, that uh, we've seen those cases cluster and actually uh, add to the numbers of, of those infected. I see. Thank you very much. And, and obviously, you're the controller for all Californians, but you also you're, you have an Asian heritage. So is there any message that you could share with the Asian Americans about, about how, how we can uh, be, a better, be, be a better Californian in this, in this current times? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, uh, I will say, um, you know, for all of us, um, I, I, I think this one actually is easy for us because um, if there's one lesson coming out of this pandemic, it's the fact that... Um, each of us is essential to the other. So in other words, we're masking, we're practicing physical distancing because we care about our loved ones. And so as long as we keep doing that, you know, take the responsibility to do that. This is not a joke. It actually helps save lives. It will save the lives of your loved ones. So continue to practice physical distancing and please wear a mask if you're around others because that is really um, just the threshold level of activity that we need to all practice to be sure that we continue to stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Control Yi. I appreciate your time. I know you're very busy, so you, but your your you know comments you share with us is very is very helpful.
Thank and you. I know that Den Dennis kind of gave me the the the, the dirty look because I'm I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna yield back to him. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of ironic and kind of funny at the same time. You know, like prior to this, I think we are wearing masks to the stores, and everybody is staring at us. And now when we go to the store, we're staring at the folks who doesn't have masks, right? So within a few months, it's just really shifted. Um, but but I I think uh, Control Yi, I I, I think. Uh, Future proof. You mentioned something earlier. Uh, how are we going to future proof it? Obviously, I think it's nice you do that, and I think it's also nice that you worry, so we don't have to. No, that's my job. So, thank you. So thank you for worrying and concern for the safety and the things we're safe, so we don't have to. And I think that's just kind of like what sort of what we need governments to do, right? And how they kind of figure out how that works and how we can uh, do. Uh, how we come back from recovery in terms of economics. And I do think that entrepreneurs will lead that charge and we need to lead that charge. It is our responsibility. And, and I totally take that to heart as well and what we need to do to enable these businesses, whether they're be coming out of the work, they, they're not in the workplace and now being as entrepreneurs themselves and starting their own uh, businesses is that we want to continue to do. So thank you very much for that. Um, I know if you can hear everybody, they are giving you a round of applause <laughs> for your time and everything. So thank you for your time. I know you have plenty of things too, so we will we'll let you go. Um, you. I just thank you. So so with that in mind, we'll close out the event and we'll see, hopefully we'll see you in person real soon. Okay. Good. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye now. Thank you, Mr. Steve. Appreciate your thoughts and wisdom. Um, as people continue to go, we can we can chat. I think we can still do that. If people want to hear us chat. Uh, great questions. I appreciate your questions. I, I think those are a lot of good insights that, that we have, and I think more importantly, it can, gives us an idea of what government is doing, right? And they're and they're how mindful they are in terms of businesses and its redevelopment itself.